Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Hi there, this is Vic Mignogna, anime voice actor for shows like Edward Elric and Full Metal Alchemist, Dark Mouse, ED and Angel, Broly and Dragon Ball Z, and lots of others. And guess where you are? You're listening to the one and only Otaku Generation. What's Reesh? What's bank? Well, you know who to thank. It's Ellen and the boys. So let's all make some noise. The Yak King never gets old. It rocks me to my duck hole. They bring all the otaku to the yard. Otaku generation, they rock hard. Otaku generation show. 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 Welcome to the show 956. Hi, hello, everyone. I am Alan. I am Matt. And I am Paul. Um, all right, so we are doing the seasonal review stuff again. Uh, so a couple little bits of business. Two Blue Sky account, three Blue Sky accounts, if you care. Um, there's OG Networks. There is Attack Generation and one for Kyle and Luke. As soon as I can kind of tie up some automation to them, I'll... Uh, I'll start posting out notifications out there as maybe an option alternative to maybe um, X or Twitter or whatever it's called today. Uh, I made a custom feed for all the shows, so if you just want to follow the custom feed. Okay, so that being said, uh, one more thing. A new Con Luke show came out. We're going to rush right into our topics this week. So to start us off, probably not the strongest of candidates, but what do we got, Matt? Okay, this is part one of our 2023 fall season um, episode one impressions. Uh, we promise no review, no critique, just impressions. Uh, first up on our list of seven titles we'll be covering in this podcast is Ojo to Banken Kun, or A Girl and Her Guard Dog. Uh, this is based off the 2018 manga series by Hatsuhara ran for nine volumes and is still ongoing and it got picked up for an anime recently and this is a romance and it's not just a romance uh, it's a sort of mentor romance which is a specific type of of romance shows that we've started noticing um, basically you you have a girl and some sort of mentor figure who is thankfully not related to her by blood. And their romance sort of grows out of him being a steadfast presence in her life and her sort of becoming enamored of him. And in this case, the uh, the gimmick is that this girl is an orphan who is adopted by a Yakuza boss. And at a very young age, she was basically foisted off on this subordinate Yakuza to take care of her and oversee her upbringing. And now she's finally old enough to head off to high school. And she announces her intention of going to a high school that is far away from her home neighborhood because she has been shunned by all the little girls and boys at her previous school because they know that she's the granddaughter of a mafia leader and they're just like stay away from her bad news don't get messed up with the ma with the yakuza um it'll all end in tears so she grew up very lonely very socially awkward and this is her you know big stab at breaking out and becoming a normal person and of course her guard dog won't let her get that far. He bribes the school to enroll him as a fellow student so he can keep an eye on her welfare. Arg. 
And that is the scenario for in which a romance starts to develop. Well, so this is, I would put this in the TV tropes category of wife husbandry. Mm. Uh, we've seen a few of those. And it is all about sort of the inappropriateness of the fantasy. And that this one is, I think, a particularly unwatchable example of the genre because it's slightly more realistically done in, drawn in terms of just like how the guy is creepy and possessing. Um, it's like textbook manipulation, but then halfway through, they try to turn it into a wacky comedy. Um, kind of like uh, Full Metal Panic? Yeah, so I mean, Full Metal Panic came to mind a couple of times because, you know, the idea is you've got somebody deeply inappropriate going to school, to high school, protecting somebody else. Uh, except in this case, nobody thinks it's even remotely weird that there is a 26-year-old guy pretending to be a high school student. They're all like, oh, yeah, he's hot. Yeah, he... Doesn't he look kind of adult? <laughs> and it's like, eh. Yeah. And he's, he's taller and bigger than everybody else. I mean, he literally stands out, stands yeah. above. Yes. Makes jokes about how his favorite hobby is torture. Um, yeah. You know, beats up the other Yakuza to a bloody pulp because they dared look at her wrong, crawls into bed with her and snuggles her and tells her she's cute. Um, I mean, it, it, this is just a, 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 a nasty show on quite a number of levels. And But it's all uh, okay because she's had an unrequited crush on him since she was a little girl. Mm -hmm. so, yeah so um this this <laughs> this this is a show that i think has a very narrow uh audience it has to be somebody who is uh, sort of looking for this specific premise and isn't too fussy about whether it's any good at delivering its premise yeah um i would recommend against it um you know, as Matt said, only first impression, but I think that's the only impression I need. Um, I'm going to give you an OG link and let's move on. OGlink.com slash 6RO um, as in orange. Very good. Okay, let's move um, on. Speaking of orange, um, our next show is Megumi no Daigo Kyo Kyo no Orenji or Firefighter Daigo Rescuer in Orange. And this is about valiant firefighters who rescue people from burning buildings. Uh, it is based off the 2020 manga by Masahito Soda, has seven volumes and is currently ongoing. And this was a recent anime adaptation. Yeah. Um, this one is an interesting entry in this week and in general. Um, you know, if you're looking for some Bishonen uh, firefighters, here you go. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say they're really be shown. They're a uh, little more normally drawn than that. I, but they're uh, all very muscly and well fit. Well, as as in fact, you would have to be to be a firefighter. You would I mean, hope. Let's, let's be fair, particularly as these folks are trying to be elite firefighters. And you know, something about the character designs was twigging the back of my my brain as I was watching this and I checked and sure enough uh, Masahito Soda is the mangaka for Capeta the go-kart racing manga that was adapted to an anime ah. it is which I was a huge fan of um, I mean I just really enjoyed that I had its flaws but I think it was uh, a really good uh, good series and that's kind of ironic given that we have a number of other motorsports uh, uh anime coming up this season uh not by Masa masahito soda so he is uh, <laughs> bran branching out a little more to what is um much much like capeta this series is trying to be very grounded uh it is about people doing a thing these people are more or less real real people you know they might have some sort of wacky mannerisms but mm -hmm. at the end of the day their challenges are human challenges and it's about getting through you know whatever the specific trials of their chosen activity is in this case it's being a firefighter and not just regular firefighters but the kind of firefighters who are elite 
firefighters who go inside the burning building and rescue people as opposed to uh, your first rank firefighters who are the guys who handle the hoses, but that's what they're all they're allowed to do. Um, so this is sort of like the the green berets of firefighters, I guess. So, I, I mean, it's a trope of disaster movies that, you know, Tokyo Tower gets it. Uh, usually, and in fact, I was I was actually kind of enjoyed that in this case, Tokyo Tower is on fire, and that is <laughs> the 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 initial challenge that uh, in in uh, sort of a, a, a time jump. Well, we're we're doing a time jump forward. Um, yeah. To, this is some exciting scenes from our protagonist's futures, but here they are back when they are lowly, you know, scrubs in a training program. Will they make it past the test? Well, you've kind of removed the mystery there, but nonetheless, you're going to enjoy <laughs> watching them because there's going to be more show after they get out of school. Really, it's not going to be all like doing uh, doing push ups and squats and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like I said, interesting entry. Um, it's not an isekai that that's a plus. Um, it's not, uh, they are not a boy band, you know, getting up on a stage and singing. So that's good. That's also a plus. Um, I, I'm a general recommend. Um, it might not be everyone's cup of tea. Um, how, how, how do the rest of you feel about this one? Oh, I'm here for it. I'm going to be watching this one for sure. Yeah. Um, it's, it's nice to see something where the, where the drama is actually based on real life situations as opposed to fighting made up extra dimensional demonic invaders using made up super talents that no one could possibly have. This is set in the real world, the modern day, and it is about actual people who do actual heroic things in their daily lives. They they risk uh, life and limb to put out fires that that threaten people's homes and businesses and save you know people who are trapped inside burning buildings it does not get much more real life heroic than that um so it's kind of interesting to see these guys um join the join the fire corps and then aspire to become these elite rescue firemen and uh their their training is not quite military, but darn near, man. <laughs> um, they they have to master not just extreme physical fitness, but they have to learn a lot of advanced and kind of esoteric techniques of like, well, how exactly do you pull people out of like burning and collapsing buildings, saving their lives without getting killed yourself? And uh I mean, yeah, it's it follows like a lot of the shonen cliches about how it's not just you know size and strength. It's it's about guts and determination. Uh, like they they make a big point of showing how like there is actually a woman in their training cadre, and she's like one of the last people to drop out of an endurance test just because she's got guts. She's got willpower. Um, she isn't the winner, but she's like second from the top. And the guy who wins is like one of our, our protagonists. Um, yeah, this is so when, when Fire Force started coming out uh, a few years back, uh, which mm -hmm. is a, another firefighter themed anime, but very much sort of demons and shonen and wacky hijinks and uh, dumb sort of sex comedy stuff. This show is what I was hoping that was going to be. Uh, it's going to be a little over the top. You know, the characters are going to be doing slightly unrealistic things for extra drama, which is fine because <laughs> it's an anime. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm actually really happy to see this one. And particularly now that I know that um, that it's it's by uh, ba, 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 was it Soda, uh, I am definitely going to be uh, following this one. Yeah. Um, available on Crunchyroll, oglink.com slash 6RP. All right, what do we have next? Okay, next up is... De -de 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 -de. Okay. Soso no Freiren, or Freiren, the farewell, the final farewell to the dead uh, English title 
Friar N Beyond Journey's End. And this this kind of made me think of, of Dungeons and Dragons and J.R.R. R. Tolkien, because one of the things that the J.R.R. R. Tolkien did was he sort of like recast creatures of myth and mythology for for his Middle Earth saga. And one of the things that that he sort of cast into stone, which was not previously the case, was that elves were tall and beautiful and undying. Um, and Dungeons and Dragons sort of like rolled that back a little bit to like, oh, well, they only live a thousand years, but that's practically the same from a human viewpoint. Um, and this story is about an elf, uh, a girl elf mage who at the beginning of episode one, has completed the world saving quest. They have, she and her team of adventurers has defeated the demon King and they're going to split up the adventuring group and go on with the rest of their lives. And there's a very sentimental thing where just before they split up the, the, the semi century, meteor shower happens and they sit in a, a field and and they watch the meteor shower and the elf girl just sort of casually comments that oh you can't really see it uh, very well from inside the city like this i should take you guys someplace next time the meteor shower comes by uh where you can get a really good view of it and uh and they're all like in 50 years and she's like yeah what but they they do all manage to live for another 50 years and they they do reunite and you know she shows them to a beautiful spot in the countryside where they they all sit and watch the the meteor showers and sort of reflect on the lives that have gone by and Friaren is is like wow it's only been 50 years and these guys are like talking about like, you know, summing up their, their entire mortal existences. I kind of wish I had gotten to know them better, even though she had spent like 10 years on an adventurer's quest with them. And it's, it's kind of touching because, um, she, you know, meets them again, says goodbye. One of them passes away shortly after she visits. And so she heads back off into the wilderness to explore nature and find new spells and new magical ingredients and whatever mages do in their spare time. And the next time she stops by the town, which is what, like 10, 20 years later, something mm -hmm. like that. Yep. Um, I think like the... The dwarf is still alive, the dwarf warrior, and sort of the, the priest that she always calls a corrupt priest, even though he's not really evil. He's just one of those guys who is like, well, my religion forbids X, Y, and Z, but it doesn't forbid W, so I'm going to go do go and do W and so sort of like ask for forgiveness on the other stuff, so... Uh, he's he's not a bad priest. He's he's kind of a casual priest, but he's a great hero, and he figures, hey, I'm owed a little a little rest and relaxation. And she finds out that in the meantime, he has actually sort of matured into a decent person at seventy years of age, and adopted a war orphan, and he he basically says, look. I know this doesn't mean a lot to you as an elf, but I'm going to die someday, probably sooner than later, like before you wander by again. So it would really be a great favor to me as a friend if you would instruct my war orphan in how to handle her magical talent, because I think she's got skill and you're the best person that I can think of to to train her to use it well. And Fryren is like, okay, yeah, I, I will do this for you both because um, we're adventuring companions and friends. 
but also because I feel bad about missing out on the lives of my human friends and I I want to take a closer interest in in human lives. So so I will I will do this for you. And uh I'm I'm assuming that the rest of the series is the adventures of Fryren and this little girl uh Fern as they sort of like travel around and Fern learns how to use her magic, which is of course incredibly potent she has a great magical talent yada 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 which is typical of a protagonist but uh this this seems to be kind of an interesting story because of the relationships not because it's about you know elves and D, &D parties you know tromping off into the wilderness to kill owl bears or whatever the fuck is menacing the villagers today yeah this is one of the the better ones that I would I would generally be interested in maybe seeing more of. Um, again, you know, my comment to Matt outside of recording was, it's this week, it's not all bad. <laughs> this is one of those not all bad comments. Um, it is available on Crunchyroll, uh, OG Link uh, slash 6RR. I wasn't forgetting you, Paul. I was going to ask if there's any additional feedback from anyone. Well, I mean, the, the point is kind of to have a discussion about this here. And I think this is an interesting show on a number of levels. Uh, it's similar in some ways to Edomai Elf from two seasons back, where you have an ex where you have a um, nominally immortal elf who's sort of acting as a goddess in modern Tokyo. Mm. And so this is it, this is really a, quite a melancholy show. Uh, it's about impermanence it's about loss and it's about you know the, our, our main character Fryren's attempts to figure out what it means to be human when she really has no idea and has gone for a thousand uh, years without the idea ever actually crossing her mind <laughs> um, and I think it helps a lot that this is one of the best executed shows of this batch. And it's probably going to be one of the best executed shows of the season from a visual perspective. I mean, we may get some better ones, but uh, they've put a, uh, quite a bit of effort into it. Uh, music's good. The character designs are good. Direction is good. Basically, everything about this is quality. Um, there's... Uh, so... The, Curiously, they chose to drop the first four episodes as more or less a mega premiere. Uh, and I don't think in this case that was necessary because the first one really sets up the, or the, the first 25-minute you know, block really sets up the, uh, the, the theme for the show. Uh, for me, though, really, the melancholy aspect is sort of the overwhelming thing. And I'm not sure that's exactly the kind of show I'm in the mood for right now. Uh, but if you are in the mood for it, I, I would definitely recommend checking this one out. And I'd recommend it quite strongly. Yeah. Oh, I, I forgot to mention this is uh, based on the manga series by Kanahito Yamada. Uh, actually has a separate illustrator, Sukasa Abe uh 2020 and then running for 11 volumes continuing on in the present and the the series is actually uh done by studio madhouse uh which always seems to to be a a clue that that things are going to be handled well they they seem to like really care about their anime at, at madhouse they had a uh sort of a, some kind of uh mediocre stretches in there and sort of the mm. late uh, 2010s but uh, but uh, they've definitely sort of slowed their output but they've uh, bounded back in the past uh, you know since the pandemic uh, not always to good success but I think this one is definitely a callback to some of their their great older series yeah. mm. Mm. okay let's uh, let's move along what do we have next okay so next on our list is mf ghost uh mm. again this is based on a manga this time by shuichi shigeno uh 2017 to the present runs for 17 volumes holy cow and this is a car racing uh anime but it's like all car racing animes 
uh, you can't just animate car racing all the time and hope to keep people interested. Uh, you've got to have characters. And, well, I don't uh, know. Their their predecessor uh, <laughs> thought that, uh, but this show thought that thought differently a little bit about it. Um, I I didn't want to reveal. I didn't want to root it for you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, well, I mean, so the so when this show came up, I'm like, ah, a car racing show. We haven't seen one of those in a while. I enjoyed Initial D. And then my second reaction was, man, those characters are hideous. Are they imitating <laughs> Initial D or is it by the same uh, mangaka? And sure Surprise. enough, it is. It's a sequel. <laughs> uh, indeed, uh, Shuichi Shigeno is the uh, creator of Initial D. And this is <laughs> the new generation. Our characters have a few ties to some of the characters. Uh, we, I don't think any of the original characters have showed up on screen yet. But... Yeah. Yeah. Um, the cars look good. <laughs> that's yeah. where i leave well, it the, i mean uh, if initial d was your thing i'm sure this will continue to be your thing um, yeah. um one of the interesting things about this is that this is sort of set in uh the near future i guess because um the the premise of this show is that well everybody else in the world has electric cars and this is sort of the uh retro gasoline powered street racing league which are the only people in the world who still have gasoline powered cars or something like that and uh that's that's their gimmick is that in a, in a world of electric cars they still have the manly throb of a gasoline engine under their control um as they race down hillsides and around sharp turns and put everything on the line for a chance of victory uh, we don't get a race in this first episode, though, which is an interesting choice, but I think uh, sort of follows uh, Initial D. Uh, we have, except our, our, our main character is already a driver. He's a very good driver, and he's in the motorsports in a big way, and he is here to make his impression on the MF Ghost scene. Yeah. Or is it um... MFG? M MFG is the racing. I think MF Ghost is just the name of the anime. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the backstory is that he's like half English, half Japanese. And of course he speaks fluent Japanese because his mother taught it to him, even though he pretty much grew up in England. So he's, he's kind of this weird hybrid of a fish out of water, uh, who looks pretty Japanese and speaks Japanese and fits in pretty well. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I this this gave me so so there is like this there's a certain um, I I mean this this is the initial D isn't exactly an exciting show, it it's sort of <laughs> slow paced and pedestrian, but it just keeps delivering that really really well in my mind. I mean like I enjoy the pace of initial D a lot. Sort of the slow, you know, those those shots where people are just standing around by the racetracks waiting for the cars to come on a summer night on a mountain pass with the cicadas chirping. Uh, you know, it, there's a very much a sense of place to that anime. Uh, then, then there's the, you know, there's always like some angle to the races to, to add that little bit of interest and always, you know, what's the danger? What's interesting about this turn? Oh, the weather's different. Uh oh, the tires are giving out. <laughs> and so it does a really good job of sort of motivating sort of details about, you know, the, the, the sport, which is the nominal topic, into drama. Not necessarily with like perfect fidelity to what this means in real life, but, you know, with an eye towards what it makes to do an exciting, but not too exciting story, right? This is, this is just a nice sort of comfortable uh, series. I'm hoping it handles its romance relationships at least fractionally better than Initial D did, because that was, without a doubt, <laughs> oh, the Achilles heel. Well, I mean, in Initial D, the relationships were the drivers and their cars, not with other people. <laughs> no, no. The, the the problem is they they added romance in, and right. the, I I I went back a couple of years ago and tried to rewatch Initial D, and I had to just skip through the romance episodes. I just could not take it. I'm afraid. Mm. Um, so we have, but we have a, a romance ish from the first uh, the first episode. The the 
cute cute girl who's you know working as like a, a a race babe but is you know not totally not interested in romance uh, it turns out that you know good old um uh, blah, 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 that kiosk, whatever the main character's name is uh, <laughs> uh kanata is 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 staying at her house so she's got the hot half english guy who's mm. really nice and he's a racer and so on so uh and in one other uh, sort of reference to the earlier series um kanata is driving a toyota 86 uh, in so? reference to the AE86, which was the uh, the auto frame of um, of that was uh, of the uh, Fujiwara Tofu uh, car in the original initial D series. Uh, yes, I think that kind of limits my appreciation of these racing series because people just sit down and rattle off stats about like and model numbers with like reverential awe, and I'm just like it's a car you know it it's better than the other car okay uh, great the, but it's, the initial it, show didn't appeal to me for a whole lot of reasons one i didn't immediately have a ps2 and when i did i didn't play the racing game that often um so there's that i had a, a bunch of friends who were big into their cars and presumed to imagine themselves as racing you know basically car racers um and you know they were in a position to use their their um first time having a, a job with any real money and buy their sort of fancy speedy cars and so this you know appealed to them and they bonded and they lived near each other and so this was a thing for them and every time i visited i i, I heard nothing but this a lot um <laughs> so you know it was what it was and it didn't appeal to me but i recognized that it appealed to others um so, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't in any of it, and it doesn't naturally appeal to me. But, you know, it appeals to Paul, so that's good. Um, yeah. It is available on Crunchyroll. Uh, OGLink.com slash 6RS, if you're interested. Okay. What, do we okay. Have? what else? So, next we venture back into the fantasy realm for this mouthful of a title. Bokensha ni naritai to miyako ni deitate musume ega ranku ni naneta, or my daughter left the nest and returned an S rank adventurer. And as you may guess, this is based off a novel series, <laughs> which was and, then uh, made but... into a light novel series, which was then made into a manga, which is now made into an anime. <laughs> But the surprising thing here is that it is not absolutely as shit as this title would lead you to believe. <laughs> uh, so the it does not have any uh, any game interfaces. It does not have people talking about their levels. It's not Nisekai. Uh, what we do have is sort of a formal guild structure that does not reflect anything in a human society. Yeah. And the reference to S rank, A rank, and so on. Other than that, though, they've mostly left that stuff out, which is a nice a nice variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is one of the... Um, uh... It, it's not so bad comment, right? This is one of those, for me, at least mm -hmm. one of the three, not four. Probably, Paul, it's probably four. For me, it's mm -hmm. three. Um, you know, this was, uh, w at least this is where I started my watch, right? Because it's it's actual name and um, not in English. It starts with a B. Um, <laughs> so, so anyhow, that being the point is this wasn't so bad. Um, I, I fairly, for the most part, I enjoyed watching this. Yeah, so what do we got, Matt? What, what's the what's the plot here? Okay, we've got a fantasy world. You've got the Adventurers Guild, and our pro or what, what seems like our protagonist is a retired adventurer, um, Belgrieve, uh, aka Belgrieve the Red Ogre, who used to be a mighty adventurer until one sad day a dire wolf managed to like gnaw off his right foot during a battle. And ever since then he's been invalided out of the adventuring game. So he went off and he sort of went into forced retirement, lived in a, in a cabin on the mountainside 
and basically just sustained his life there doing tasks for the local farmers, defending the village as necessary, training children and, you know, survival in the forest and that sort of thing. And then one day while he's gathering like herbs or something in the forest, he discovers a foundling baby. And it's not a case of somebody left their baby here while they were out gathering herbs themselves. It was, no, we are abandoning this baby we cannot take care of in a baby hamper with good luck charms to hopefully prevent it from being eaten by wolves before somebody finds it and takes care of it. And naturally, he's a good-hearted guy, so he adopts the baby and raises her as his own daughter. And she turns out to be, you know, very ganky and virtuous and energetic and ambitious. And when she comes of age, with all of her father's training, she sets off for the big city to join the Adventurer's Guild and follow in his footsteps uh, to earn glory and do good. And she does. She she goes off, and she does pretty well at the adventuring gig. She gets to the point where she's actually an S-rank adventurer with a team of her own. Um, I'm not really well versed on what the ranks of adventurers are, but the way the the story treats it, an S rank is is pretty good, if not the top. So she schleps around with um, her magic user and her cleric. Um, she herself is a warrior type, and they defeat monsters and they fight bandits and they rescue people and everything's going really well. And eventually, she decides. It's been long enough. I should go back to the the mountainside cabin and visit my father and just catch up with him because we haven't seen each other in forever. And the whole first episode is just her constantly being stymied by sort of like the call to adventure. It's like she heads off to her father's place. No, she can't go because... A, a stampede of fire of giant fire ants is attacking the city and they need their best adventurers to fight off the monsters. And then another time she's actually on her way and they discover like a noble's daughter who is being attacked by bandits. So they've got to rescue her and, and take her back to her family homestead to comfort her dying father and just so on and so on and so on. So by the time the episode ends, she's just constantly penning more and more apologetic letters to her father about, I'm sorry, I can't, I tried to come and visit you, but X happened. I'm going to see if I can arrange vacation days real soon now, I promise, and come visit you. I really miss you. <laughs> And, and that's pretty much the the setup for the whole series. Yeah, so there is not a lot of action in this show. I mean, this is deliberately very slow paced. It's meant to be very cozy, and, and you know, all of these you know, sort of uh, you know wacky fantasy you know attacks of giant ants and so on uh, that uh, that Angeline has to deal with are clearly meant to be sort of a a, a not particularly subtle metaphor for for people who feel a lot of obligation about their jobs mm -hmm. and just are kind of put down by you know slightly exploitative employers and can never actually get what they want out of life um but the other side of it is it looks as if this is going to be a, a series about her having a very nice relationship with her father um and this is a this is a nice show as near as i can tell from this first episode yeah it, it seems like a nice show, and I'm curious to watch more of it to see, you know, does she ever finally get to, like, reunite with her father? And I'm assuming that since they, they gave him so much development in the first episode that he's going to join up with her, and then they go adventuring. Oh, I hope not. No, you don't think no, so? No, maybe, maybe he will. Maybe he will. Well, I mean, actually, and we, I can see, actually, I, I was assuming this was more of a place-based 
uh, story, but you could be right because he's sort of um, wondering about, well, you know, I lost my chance to be an actual good adventurer. You know, now I'm stuck here, but you know, it was okay. I didn't really think my life would end up here, but you know, I'm, I'm serving a purpose. I'm, you know, the mm -hmm. pillar of the town helping raise these kids. And I don't get to see my daughter as much as my, I like, and she's off in the big city, but you know, she's kind of living my dream and that's okay. Yeah. So I, I, I can't tell which way it's going to go. Um, and uh, one episode is not a very satisfying amount of this show to watch uh, just because of how little happens. I mean, it sets up its premise and you see a lot of like boring scenes in the Capitol that burn a lot of screen time and yeah, well, well that's fine, I guess. But uh, hmm. yeah, I, I'll, I'll watch some more of this if I if have some time. I mean, it's, uh, you know, watching like three episodes at once seems like what you'd need to do to get any actual satisfaction <laughs> out of it. Yeah. Um, it is available on Crunchyroll, oglink.com slash 6RU. Um, okay, so moving on. Regrettably, we should talk about them, but we really should just end the show now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we got two more left, but we'll be done by then. So number six of seven is... Ragna Crimson, and it's another fantasy kind of show. Uh, this is based off the manga of the same name by Daiki Kobayashi. Um, there is the Japanese title is just Ragna Crimson in Katakana, so that's all all the title there is. And it's basically two adventurers, Crimson, uh, who is a young girl who is like a prodigy dragon slayer. She's a uh, warrior, huh? Uh, Leo, Leonica is the Leonica. Yeah, oh, I think okay. Crimson is a character who shows up later. I think she oh, was the, right. one in the yeah, final end okay. of the show. Yeah, Leo Leonica. is the other one. Yeah, and her companion Ragna, who is basically a drip and not really good at anything, despite being a warrior himself, and he he's basically there to honestly be be Leonica's squire. <laughs> Uh, except that he keeps having these horrible prophetic dreams and portents and omens and visions of Leonica going up against a top rank dragon warrior and just getting horribly, horribly like one shotted by the, by the like next you know, level dragon warrior, because most of the dragons are just sort of almost mindless beasts. They're, they're basically just mob. Their whole thing is I got flame breath and I'm not afraid to use it. And they're, they're sort of a constant, but, um, manageable menace to the kingdoms of, of the land. They, they don't really seem to, act in concert they just pop up here and there and start laying waste to things and then the adventurers get summoned out and they there's basically enough dragons menacing the land that the adventurers guild can survive just fighting dragons all the time um, so they're dangerous they cause devastation but on the other hand Considering the vast numbers of them that the Adventurers Guild slays, they don't seem to be that much of a problem. Um, until, dun dun dun, suddenly the dragons do start acting in concert. There's a huge migration of dragons to like one specific place, and they just start laying waste to stuff in earnest and just overrunning the the human defenders in a non-trivial way and all of a sudden the tough but kind of idyllic existence of the dragon slaying ad guild adventurers is sort of anteed up to the point where it's like these dragons are now a serious major threat to not just a village here and there, but now the whole kingdom and maybe many of the kingdoms and um, 
Ragnar's visions of Leonica getting killed by dragons now start to seem a lot more plausible and not just, you know, fretting and worrying fantasies, but they start to seem like, yeah, this is actually a true prophecy. And holy crap, my beloved Leonica is going to get herself killed fighting dragons. What the fuck do I do about that? Holy crap, holy crap, holy crap. And Ragna basically uh, just starts getting more and more stressed out as the adventures go on. Leonica, you know, goes out, kills a dragon, goes out, kills a dragon, and Ragna just gets more and more worried every time she does. And then when news of a great dragon migration shows up, and holy crap, Dragons have destroyed this entire city over in the next kingdom. Uh, it really starts to get very, very worrisome, almost to the point of panic. And that's where the big drama of the episode springs from. Yeah. Um, so we have a show which is indeed a straight up fantasy. Uh, it has the nominal sort of uh, guild tropes, though, as noted, pared down to a guild that just fights dragons, which is uh, a, a bit of a novelty. I mean, it's an entire <laughs> economy based on slaying dragons. And the big worry when the dragons go and start attacking the other city is man, how are we going to eat without dragons to slay? Um, <laughs> so the the show is is not the one to turn to for sort of a deep economic analysis or in fact much of anything um it is however if you are in the mood for an age gap romance this show has a pretty not as icky as the last uh episode iteration of that where uh, Ragna, it's unclear how he is. He's definitely uh, at least 18, I'd say, is, you know, just besotted with this 12 year old and bathes her and cuts her hair and is just more or less obsessed with her mm -hmm. until we get to the twist in this episode, which I guess we won't spoil, but is utterly predictable by when you look at the character designs. I mean, it was <laughs> from the very first moment, uh, it was so obvious what was happening, but you know, that was fine. And I, I found the first half of this, because this is a double length premiere, I found the first half of this utterly excruciating to watch in just its uh, insipidity, its predictability, its uh, awful protagonists and, and art's not the worst except for like the character designs like uh like leo uh her her face ain't right man <laughs> and 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 ragna's eyes you know he's drawn with these you know these he just has these cyan eyes with no pupils in them and yeah uh, not as bad as uh, the guard dog one. There, there was something deeply wrong with, with that character's eyes. But um, <laughs> uh, the second half of the show, I did not hate as much. So, and I think I got to say, they probably made a good call to do the, this double length because the first was just completely pointless. You could have cut most of it out. Uh, the second half was actually a little more interesting. It was the things that are different. It is, you know, his, his discovery of his power. Um, you know, so there were some fights. The fights weren't the worst in the world. Um, <laughs> He's ends up way too powerful at the end of all this in a relatively uninteresting way. But you know, it's a you know a dark fantasy. Uh, he's our tragic hero who's made sacrifices to save the twelve twelve year old that he is in love with. Um, and there's going to be some big sort of meta plot that comes up. So I, I'm not going to watch more. But surprisingly, I did not hate it as by the end as much as I did. Uh, at the start. So I guess that's um, an accomplishment. I, Not a recommendation, but an accomplishment. I couldn't figure out why you would want to watch this at all. Like, I like, <laughs> and I mean this to boil it down, not to be mean, is like a, a show typically has like a mech. It has that appealing quality. It has the romance. It has that appealing quality. It has um, your 
other things you like, your Pokemon ripoff quality. It has, you know, the fighting and the reasons to have lame scenarios to fight. You know, that this doesn't have any of that quality that are strong enough for me to, like, have any reason to want to understand why I would want to watch it. Again, for some people, the Isekai and the video ga- the card game thing and stuck in a video game thing is appealing. This doesn't have anything like that to me. Yeah, well, I mean, I could, I could see, I mean, uh, to play devil's advocate here, I mean, I'm not particularly enchanted by it, but the way they ended up setting up their mystery um, was reasonable. Um, I mean, you know, there's a, a, you know, like, ooh, how is this going to play out? What's the real story here? Who are these characters? What are their links with each other? And now that, you know, fate is broken, you know, how is it going to play out? Um, that's, I mean, I don't like the characters. I don't like the word, world. I don't like the uh, muddy uh, red uh, crimson filters that they lay across every fight scene. But, um, but no, I can see why someone would want this or would, would watch this if they you know, were looking for a, a Nani Sekai dark fantasy series. Not a great entry, but an adequate one. Yeah. All right. Well, if you are interested, it's available on high dive, oglink.com slash 6RV. Um, all right, moving on to one. All right, more. our final show of the episode Saiken Gakuin no Maken Sukai, or the Demon Sword Master of Excalibur Academy, which is an anime adapted from a light novel, which was then adapted into a manga and finally into an anime. And there you have it, folks. That is uh, the end of this episode. Our <laughs> season impressions <laughs> for fall 2023. Um, again, this is one of those shows that starts off with the end of the previous great age. Um, because everything that happens in this show is actually sort of like after the fall. Um, because the, the, the premise is... A thousand years ago, uh, the six lords of evil were, you know, laying waste to the kingdoms of humanity and getting ready to conquer the entire land when they were opposed finally by the six great heroes. And the six great heroes were victorious and they killed all of the dark lords except for one because the forces of evil realized that If all of the Dark Lords, you know, fought the great heroes and they all lost, then that would be game over for the forces of darkness. So they said, okay, the last surviving Dark Lord, you are ordered to stop fighting the great heroes and you are going to go into suspended animation or get reborn or something or another in a thousand years. And once you revive, you will regain your unholy power, draw all the forces of of darkness to you, create a terrible army of wickedness, and you will conquer the human lands just as the original plan was, but we'll just kick it down the road a thousand years. And that's where we pick up the story, because in the, the present day, Humanity has forgotten all about the, the, you know, six Dark Lords. They've forgotten all about the ancient war. They've developed technology, and they're just sort of puttering around dealing with their present-day monsters, these things called voids. And uh, a pair of explorers stumble across the tomb of the last Dark Lord, and... It has been a thousand years and he does wake up and he frees himself to wreak a horrible vengeance on the unsuspecting human world, uh, except that he's not exactly the great dark Lord anymore. As part of the resurrection, he is resurrected as his 10 year old human self before he became the terrible dark Lord for the forces of evil. And he's still got some of his sorcery and some of his abilities, but not all of them. And he's sort of like 
well, this is going to be kind of a stumbling block in the road to global domination. Uh, plus, he, as a 10-year-old boy, he thinks that the girl who rescued him or broke him out of his imprisonment is really, really hot, as is her, her co-scout, another 16-year-old girl in a short-skirted, cute uniform. So, on the one hand, he's splatting void monsters who inconvenience him but on the other hand he's really got the hots for for these girls um Rizelia, ray cristalia is her full name i guess and i i guess what's her face um uh, so that's that's sort of the gimmick is that yes he's the terrible dark lord who's here to conquer the world and he's also a 10 year old boy with all that that entails yeah, and uh, and of course the girls are constantly mashing his face into their boobs or flashing him and making jokes about what a perv he is. And oh no, we're just joking because you're only 10 and you can't be a perv when you're 10. Uh, so this is yet another of uh, a, a grim little subgenre we've been seeing a lot of where super powerful asshole from a past fantasy age is reincarnated as a much younger asshole in a much later fantasy age in the same world <laughs> where nobody knows about his magic but he's still super powerful he still super knows everything except he has to cooperate with hot girls to get things done yeah he never had to cooperate with the hot girls before yeah um available on high dive um the network for winners oglink.com slash six rw <laughs> see i'm not a fan. Uh, okay and in case it wasn't clear this the series is a sack of shit i mean this is yeah. terrible just absolutely god awful i cringed <laughs> every moment it was on the screen i hated it yeah um and we talked way too much about it um, okay, that uh, that gets us to the point where we can conclude and close the show. So uh, we we're just going to end the show. So that being said, for all the things we've mentioned, please visit our website, www.tiggeneration.net or ognetworks.tv. Um, you want to come and hang out with us in Discord, you can always do that, oglink.com slash Discord. Uh, what did I say? OGlink.com slash Discord. Um, and you want to become a patron, a supporter, you can do that. OGlink.com slash support slash Patreon slash Patreon. Um, did I talk about email? You guys hopefully you already know what our email is at this point. All right. We got a lot of, a lot of things in this cup. So I'm just going to pull a bunch out and dig deep down in there to grab something. Okay, mm. grab something. Now I'm putting them all back. Okay, there you go. No ASMR for you guys. Um, all right. Uh, really? Oh, okay. Paul, you're going to hate this one. Um, I hate it already. <laughs> a closed mind is like a closed book, just like a block of wood. Oh, my God. God, that is what? one of the worst we've had yet. <laughs> I, I, and I mean, this one, you can't even like twist it around to, to, to make it, you, it, you think it might be some kind of advice uh, because of that, in, you know, just that, that ludicrously inane ending tacked on the end. I, I mean, if they, mm, no, 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 this is, so, and, and it's present tense, right? I mean, the present tense is the original sin of not a fortune. And as such, there is no doubt that this is not a fortune. Yep. He spoke the truth. Uh, all right. Well, thank you everyone this week. We will be checking down the line of the seasonal reviews. Um, Paul, you had said something like 50 are at, uh, coming at us, so that leaves us, what, 43 remaining? <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I think my, my, last, my last count was only 48. Oh, okay. Uh, so. <laughs> so, so we got 41 <laughs> left. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're almost there. Oh, well, that's all right then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there will be – probably won't be much interruption, but, you know, we'll, we'll, by the time we get done, it will be turkey time. So – um yeah all right well that's where we're at people that's what you can look forward to uh hopefully uh the the list of options are better next week um but that being said we'll we'll see you then have a good one